I'm a fully grown man watching cartoons on the internet for my very lucrative and successful career, meaning my life has peaked. And since I'm currently living in the high-flying prime time of my lifetime, I will never know the fears of facing irrelevancy or having to reinvent myself to recapture the general public's favor after the ever-accelerating digital age creeps my entertainment value out of public consciousness and into submission. My ever-evolving stage presence and timeless material will guarantee my success for my entire life. But what if it didn't? What if I was still the beloved titan of industry that I am now, but the industry was changing at such a rapid pace that just being really good wasn't good enough? What if I had to do something radical? Something extreme? Something edgy? What if I had to do what Warner Brothers did to the Looney Tunes back in 2005? What if I had to fuck everything up? Now this whole video is gonna focus on the Looney Tunes property as a whole and a specific spinoff from their time, but for context, we're just gonna talk right now about Bugs Bunny, and you'll see why later. Or you won't. I don't really care. It's not my job to force you to pay attention. It's just my job to make sure that you're just interested enough to keep the video running. Bugs Bunny is a time-honored warrior of sarcastic comedy. Who in the hell doesn't know Bugs Bunny? No one. So I'm gonna skip the cliche YouTuber history lesson that takes up 80% of the video to pad runtime, and we're gonna get to the good bit. Bugs Bunny started out goofing around in cartoon shorts. The uh, short cartoon films were in 2023 and the term shorts has taken on a far more disgusting and sinister meaning. Bugs Bunny started out goofing around in short cartoon films in the 1930s and maintained the same format from pretty much then until now. Bugs sits around doing nothing with his worthless life, some adversary shows up to fuck with him, and Bugs turns the tables by fucking with them so hard that they end up either dead or insane. It's funny stuff. And all of that works super well, swell, peachy, super duper keen, until it didn't. Hello, and welcome back to my bathroom. I'm recording this in the future. You can tell it's the future, because I'm wearing what everyone will wear in the future. I'm here to show you the bathroom of the future. As you can witness, everything on my counter is courtesy of Manscaped who's the sponsor of today's video. I'm well known for being a very clean-shaven YouTuber. Some of you might have giggled at that, but I got cheeks and a, a fucking neck too, you know? And I happen to use the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 for all of my shaving needs. I use it here in the far off future because of its precision space age technology designed for a comfortable close shave, especially on your no-no parts that I can't show on camera. But what I can show on camera is proof that this is a fantastic product. Do you see this disgusting neck stubble that I've let grow on my disgusting neck disgustingly? Well. What if I showed you that the Manscaped's lawnmower trimmer was able to get rid of it with ease? You hear that sound? That's success. And I hope that Manscaped really likes that because I can't re-record this. Now me showcasing the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer on just my neck is all you're gonna get for free. You're gonna have to pay for all the juicy details thanks to capitalism. But if you wanna pay for that incredible trimmer that I just showed off and forgot to plug in properly, you can get it for 20% off. And that's because I have an offer for Manscaped's Deluxe Shaving Kit, which is also going to come with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Toner Spray, which is stuff to make your testicles smell really, really good. A very important fact in the future. Entire political campaigns are one on ball smell in the year 2044. You're also going to get the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair and Delicate Trimmer for other places on the body but you don't have to just use it on those places. You can shave anywhere your imagination takes you. Watch. Amazing. It got at least one hair. Order this kit now and you'll also get a travel bag made of leather that's quite nice and made of a 
rugged design, as well as some boxers that have been crafted to hold your testicles better than normal boxers. I left mine in the plastic wrap and I'm not demoing them because YouTube, the fucking fascists that they are, said that I can't show my testicles being inserted in the boxers, so we're gonna have to do that another day. And if you want all of these wondrous bounties including free shipping and two free gifts. You can get 20% off by going to manscaped.com with promo code HUGBEES. That's, I'll bring the savings to you. Manscaped.com, promo code HUGBEES, free shipping, two free gifts, 20% off. Manscaped, the best thing to use when you wake up in a stranger's bathroom. You see, Bugs' shtick was beginning to run dry with the more modern and sophisticated cartoon watchers of the 2000s. I am, of course, talking about children, and I'm also not at all joking. During this literal millennial time period, the cartoon block run by Warner Brothers, Kids WB, was hitting a very sharp downturn. A big contributing factor very well was probably the increasingly impressive competition's lineup. And this competition didn't even come purely from the outside. Cartoon Network by this point was also a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, but their rip-roaring entrees, I meant to say entries, but we're keeping that in, into the modern era of animation definitely hampered any blossoming interest the youth market would have in the Looney Tunes. Let's take a look at a lineup of popular Cartoon Network cartoons from the early 2000s, largely considered the absolute peak of that channel's history. Johnny Bravo, Dexter's Lab, Courage the Cowardly Dog, Ed, Ed, Nettie, which, by the way, is the greatest cartoon of all time, no discussion there, Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Megas XLR, which... <sighs> I know I, I know I say every fucking video I have to make another video on something, but I just want any excuse to watch that show again because gone far too quick before it's time. Oh, how I miss it. Anyway, Powerpuff Girls, and perhaps most importantly for this discussion, Samurai Jack, Teen Titans, and the influx of popular animes to the West, such as Dragon Ball Z. Now, those last three are extremely important, but really take the whole list in. Did you notice a pattern? We are now reaping the rewards of the golden age of television animation. The 90s cartoon renaissance has bled into the experimentation of the early 2000s. Shows are getting more complex, more character driven in their writing, more nuanced in their themes, and most importantly, darker. Oh sure, Ed, Ed, Nettie, and Johnny Bravo regularly featured slapstick that was directly inspired by Looney Tunes, but they also drove into struggles and relatable problems that kids could identify with, such as trying to scam all your friends and trying to sleep with hot chicks. Okay, obviously that's a joke, but both shows were actually really well-written fish-out-of-water stories about maturity and growing up. Courage the Cowardly Dog and Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy weren't afraid to be genuinely scary and unnerving in terms of their intended audience. Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls, Megas XLR, Samurai Jack, Teen Titans, Dragon Ball Z, all those other animes, which I want to remind everyone that Dragon Ball Z especially used to air on Cartoon Network during regular daytime programming hours for many years, were really fucking violent. Super unapologetically violent. Put the fucking clip on the screen where Jack cuts a beetle robot in half and like it's the oil is a stand-in for blood but it's really obvious it's supposed to be blood and he's fucking bathing in the stuff and that was like episode two now later on samurai jack did actually kill actual humans but that was on adult swim and explicitly made for the audience that grew up with it this was for kids this is nuts looney tunes never did any of that stuff. Yeah, Looney Tunes cartoons feature relatable issues, but they were ones that typically appealed to adults and the nuances of the nuclear family dynamic, not discussions aimed for school children specifically. Yeah, Looney Tunes totally could be scary and unnerving, but it was typically done for a gag or two and then moved on from. And yes, duh, Looney Tunes is violence. Yes, 
but never beyond comedic effect. People in Looney Tunes don't ever actually get hurt unless it's there to make you laugh. Now fucking Tom and Jerry, on the other hand, dip their toes into the water of dark shit. Ooh-wee, but that's another story. Well, I think I made my point. I'll go ahead and mosey on over to the entire reason I made the- Oh, wait! It's Nickelodeon and, and SpongeBob SquarePants! A whole balloon I didn't even talk about! And then, of course, there was also the Disney Channel, which... You know, I gotta be honest, Kids WB was pretty fucked by this point. Yeah, they had original programming and all the backlog of WB stuff they could ever rely on, but Looney Tunes ain't cutting it no more. Now, Warner Brothers did see this coming for a while and took measures to counteract it. Typically, since the 1960s, the Looney Tunes short films and other relevant side series like Merry Melodies and everything in that house were mashed together into compilation shows that were shown as 30-minute episodes on, well, Kids WB and Cartoon Network and pretty much every network they could. Now, when you're just shoehorning in technically reruns of classic animation stylings alongside these new age modern cartoon affairs, it's gonna get old quick. So now, it's time for everyone's favorite dumpster fire lit aboard a sinking ship. Spin-offs! First, Warner Brothers hits everyone with Tiny Toon Adventures back in 1990, which was good. You make a new cast of characters that don't skew too far from their original formulas, you make them punky teens with attitude, thanks Power Rangers, and you update the pop culture references to be ones that the parents watching with their kids will actually understand and laugh at, instead of ones that you'd have to have stormed the beaches of Normandy to get a chuckle at. Whammo! You've now got a good show that's a nice little passing of the torch. They even managed to work in a ton of cameos of the original, like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and Porky Pig and all the old Looney Tunes. It's a, a perfect way to say, hey kids, look, this shit's cool and it's for you. It's also even produced by Steven Spielberg, which now means that we get a big giant budget and access to the entire Warner Brothers studio in-house full piece orchestra, which leads to some of the best music work in television cartoon history, and I would say debatably some of the best music accompaniment in cartoons ever. You know what? Fuck it. Watch this. Watch this scene right now. Do it. Pay attention. If you know absolutely anything about art, animation, directing, or composition, you know that that shot was really, really fucking impressive. And also, maybe even retroactively more importantly, this series eventually led to Steven Spielberg making even more cartoons with Warner Brothers, which culminated in Freakazoid, which, while well, fancy fucking that, I just might have an attachment or two to that show. This episode is also dedicated to Mrs. Ashley Hugbees of Fuller's Earth, Arizona because we like saying the word Hugbees. Go ahead, try it. Hugbees. Hugbees! 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 I don't know. Great start, Warner Brothers. What's next? Oh yeah, Tasmania. Uh, okay, so I don't, I don't really remember this show, Tasmania. Uh, I even googled a bunch of threads on it, and it seems like it always falls into the camp of, oh, yeah, oh, I've seen that, yeah. Oh, I remember that one, yeah. But no one remembers anything about it, just that it was a thing. Uh, reviews of it that I dug up from back when it actually was, like, airing seem positive. People remember it and go, oh, cool. The end. It's fine. Okay, after that, we have a host of really lazy spin-offs that are actually just rebranded clip shows. Uh, then we got Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries, which I guess if you can't get enough Scooby-Doo, then this is the motherfucking show for you. Baby Looney Tunes, which doesn't really count because it's explicitly made for preschoolers and a younger audience, and it would air in time slots when all the grown-up kids were at school. So that doesn't matter. And then, <sighs> Duck. Dodgers, yes, yes, 
Warner Brothers, you nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. You took Looney Tunes, you found the perfect format and universe to expand on, and you turned it into a slightly more mature, more world-built, more complex show that blended action set pieces with the old classic Looney Tunes comedy. Duck Dodgers is a masterclass in how to make a spin-off and also has one of the most bizarre crossovers in cartoon history that's on my video list, I swear to fucking God it is. Even with all that, it still wasn't good enough. How quickly we forget that in 2003, Looney Tunes tried to capitalize on this newfound momentum with the old, it's working, it's working plan, and made Looney Tunes back in action. A movie so flim flammy, it killed both the Looney Tunes new potential hype and Brendan Fraser's career. Again. But he's back now, so everything's fine. Look, by this point, we've reached 2005, and none of this is good enough. They had the newfound swing of Space Jam, but then it was just like flop after flop, and all the good stuff just kind of became its own thing. It didn't really carry the brand any further. The Looney Tunes are losing their dominating grip on the market that says, Disney's too babyish for me. Give me something that goes harder. So they went even harder. What I'm about to play for you now is the initial pitch concept for what this entire video has been leading up to. If you don't know what I'm about to talk about, I just want to remind you, this is absolutely 100% real and was supposed to be taken seriously. Hey, you gotta check this out. Check what out? The TV. Scientists are now saying that the giant meteor is going to strike the Earth any second. The Earth has fallen off axis. Fighting the giant mutated world. Supernatural warlords with plans of world domination. The discovery of a hidden dimension. With the world in peril, some say our only hope would be a team of superheroes. Super 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 What's up, Doc? The year 2772. The world threatened by sinister forces of evil. The solution, a superhero team like no other. And that's where I come in. I made a few phone calls and organized this little group. Duck, the weapons expert. Slick, vehicles and surveillance. Roadster, the speed. Lexi Bunny, the disguise expert. Spaz, the muscle. And of course, the leader of the pack, the master with his hands, Buzz Bunny. Although you might think these faces are familiar, trust me, this is a whole new world. This is the world of the lunatics. Wow, that thing looks so cool, and I'm totally not being sarcastic about it. Hey, let me play a clip from a local news organization covering the reboot and polling a child on what he thinks about it. What do you think, Kenny? Uh, that's an evil bug, Bunny, I think. It is. Wow. That response wasn't good at all. Well, if children don't like it, then maybe maybe the older nostalgic audience for these good old cartoons will dig it and think it's a cool, silly idea. Let's watch this clip from a viral internet video made back in 2006 talking about this whole thing. I don't like you. Hell yes you do, you butt fucking This was bad. This was really bad. Absolutely everyone hated this fucking thing. It was so bad, people made petitions online to change the design structure of it to make it less... nightmarish. Oh, and by the way, the leading poll was created by a 12-year-old boy from Oklahoma. That's how much they missed the mark. That kid's literally even too young to have appreciated the Looney Tunes in any meaningful way. How fucked up is this? Whatever you call him, this certainly isn't your daddy's bugs. 
the news hit the blogosphere splat like a pie in the face. Animation chat rooms went berserk. Someone tell me this is all a big joke. Continue to draw me like this, Buster, and we'll both be out of work. Surprising that they feel that there's really a need to update Bugs or the other characters. Cartoon historian Peter Sanderson teaches comics as literature at New York University. He cautions, When you stray too far from the core, it doesn't last. They're, it's like a rubber band, you're pulling it out of shape and it snaps back. Eventually you return to the tradition because that's what has made the character last for decades. Okay, so that guy's, that guy's doing an Elmer Fudd impression, right? <laughs> that's total. he's totally doing an Elmer Fudd impression, right? <laughs> no? So I'm, I'm just an asshole for making fun of how a man speaks, huh? Yeah, I figured. And shockingly, the large soulless corporation behind this entire mess did the exact opposite thing that each and every facet of their business model and competition trained them not to do. They listened to and gave a shit about their fans. The idea was shit canned, it was never to be seen again, and the rest is history. No, I'm just fucking with you. For those of you who watched Cartoon Network in the mid-2000s, you know what I'm about to say. For those of you who aren't aware of this and haven't seen it, I'm so sorry I have to do this to you. Lunatics Unleashed aired its pilot episode in 2005. Let's watch the new and improved intro as best we can, depending on how I have to edit it for copyright. Don't worry, I have the answer. Sometime during production, the designs were softened to an almost comical degree, and all of the characters' names and likenesses were changed to give them stronger ties to the baseline characters from which this shitty fever dream all drew inspiration. In terms of lore, the internet's favorite thing, this cast of superheroes, I, I honestly don't know what they're supposed to be, are descendants of the original 1940s all-star cast. This isn't Daffy Duck, it's Danger Duck. This isn't Road Runner, it's Rev Runner. This isn't the Tasmanian Devil, it's Slam Tasmanian, which, all right, you know what, that is actually way cooler. And keynote speaker of this shit show convention, this isn't Bugs Bunny, this isn't Buzz Bunny, it's Ace Bunny. And don't worry, everyone hated him too. Oh kids, you don't understand. We're bringing Looney Tunes into the new millennium in a way that the original cast could not. It's all for the kids. I thought you weren't replacing Just them. Just think of all the kids. All those happy boys. <sighs> oh yeah. Yeah. Warner Brothers, in their infinite wisdom, were in too deep to this debauchery and figured their only way forward was to blast their way through, dump what they had, and move on. And by dump what they had, I mean air the show for two full seasons? Not just finish one and try it, but do it again? Even though everyone hated it. I'm very carefully tiptoeing around this discussion because in the comments, there's going to be like five people who are like, dude, Lunatics Unleash kicks ass and it's the bestest show ever made. And I just want you to know that you're wrong and we'll see why you're wrong because we're going to watch it together, but I'm not at that part yet. There's nothing left to really do by this point except to watch the first episode and talk about it. Now, Look, I could have just watched the show and critiqued it from the beginning, but to me, knowing all of this context really drives in home the diarrhea on display for a lot of my deconstructions. Just reviewing the show is one thing, but learning the sad, silly tales around them is like the cherry on top of the sundae. If you're going in blind to this whole thing like I was before I did all this Googling and tracked down a copy of the show, well then allow me to pop your cherry. We 
begin in Acmetropolis, a city where Blade Runner vomited all over Cyberpunk 2077 and then forced it to eat that vomit, which it then proceeded to vomit all over Blade Runner 2049, in the middle of a dangerous, record-breaking heat wave. But because irony is a great way to be funny when your writers are too stupid to be subtle, a mysterious giant iceberg shows up in the middle of the metropolis and begins freezing all the citizens. <laughs> Now that is cold. Where'd you get it? Iceland? Actually, no. I just picked up at a pizza joint downtown, which I must say is abnormally cold for this time of year. But if you really like the pizza they have in Iceland, I could go back and get somebody back in 4.2 seconds. But of course, that is just an estimation because you never know about traffic. Okay, I got. I, I gotta sit down. I'm gonna sit down on the. I'm sit. I'm gonna sit on the floor. Oh god. Oh, I'm gonna. Oh fuck. Okay, my head really. Oh god. My head really fucking hurts. There is so much going on in this introduction that I already need to make fun of. I'm gonna get a chair. Okay, first off, it's pretty common grade school haha -ha, gotcha knowledge to point out that Iceland and Greenland are misnomers because Greenland is about 80% covered in ice and Iceland by contrast features far more temperate foliage and you know, regular wilderness, not like tundra shit. Now, normally I wouldn't care about this potentially better joke, but the one delivering it is Techie Coyote. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the, he's the descendant of Wiley Coyote. Wile E. Coyote, a character whose entire shtick is knowledge blinded by hubris. Techie Coyote should have made the distinction and honed in on the funnier punchline for that. Instead of setting up Rev Runner for the punchline, which was not nearly as funny. Second of all, this is our first introduction to any of the lunatics. Techie Coyote and Rev Runner of the lunatic. Okay, pause. Pause. These names are fucking hysterical. If these were done as a joke, or done to intentionally try to be as over the top and parodying of the 90s edginess as possible, then this would absolutely wrap around being cool again. I would love it. I would actually love it. But the fact that this was all meant to be taken completely 100% seriously means that I'm going to have to say these names for you in a very matter-of-fact announcing voice just to get it out of my system so I can read the rest of this script. Okay. Okay, here we go. Ace Bunny. Lexi Bunny. Danger Duck. Rev Runner. Slam Tasmanian. Techie Coyote. Those are their names, and I will respect them. Sorta. Kind of, not really, but back to the fucking video. This is the first introduction to any of the lunatics, and it immediately opens up 600 questions, and all of them are pretty stupid. If we assume the pizza place was frozen, like the people in the intro, how is the pizza fully frozen, but not the box? If we assume the pizza place wasn't directly attacked, but is facing residual effects of all the freezing going on, does that mean Rev Runner was served an obviously inedible frozen chunk of water with the Italian dish trapped inside it caveman style? Or did he steal it from the restaurant in the middle of a literal supervillain terrorist attack? Or if the attack didn't affect the pizza joint, which seems to be the most likely scenario because Rev Runner's demeanor implies he's completely oblivious that there's an attack going on when he went outside, why is the pizza frozen to begin with? Did Rev Runner speedboat his way into the pizza's industrial freezer and rip out some leftovers that the employees were saving for the end of their shift? Then he made a mad dine and dash for the exit? The big the bigger question is, doesn't this all likely mean Rev Runner just stole a pizza? And he's supposed to be a... Okay, a, a, I don't know if he's a superhero, but at the very least, an original character in a dark alternate universe Looney Tunes fanfiction timeline roleplay discord? Again, I really don't know what everyone here does but I don't think stealing pizzas is their MO. And finally, there is one question that this scene does answer, and it has nothing to do with this show specifically. It's just filling in some mental gaps for me that I've had going on for a while. I get it now, this dynamic. I totally get it now. I fully comprehend how a sizable chunk of the internet can put a romantic and overtly sexual relationship between these two. This scene has confirmed it, I get it now. Hey Ace, 
On it, Tech. Oh, Jesus. Jesus fucking Christ. I just did a comical over the top Japanese pratfall that was so unbelievable. Look. Yes, I know. In the intro to the show, it gives us a rundown of the team and all of their powers, but all I can fucking see here is, and say it with me, because I know you know the words at home, edgy Bugs Bunny shooting laser beams out of his eyes. This is not a show. This is a fucking robot chicken skit. This is not a legitimate Warner Brothers property. This is the ramblings of a stay with his parents stoner, not anything sensical that a scriptwriter should even acknowledge is a good idea. This is what you do when you make an anime parody episode. Not the first fucking frames that your most recognized character base is to be judged on. Look, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little long-winded. Allow me to put it a little more succinctly. What the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on is that the writers are at least understanding Daffy's character, or rather his super descendants, who's just literally him with a different name. Duck here spends his introductory moments flexing in the mirror while trying to come up with a superhero name that properly fits his incredible range of powers. That's a Daffy Duck moment, which means this character might actually work. Oh, oh yeah, and one more important detail. He's not shooting fucking laser beams out of his eyes. Okay. You see this door behind me? You see this door right here? This big door that somehow if I hit it, it would be made out of cloth on my end, even though it's made of steel. This door is about to reveal Lola Bunny's descendant, and I'm really, really curious what's going on here. Now you see, in the original Space Jam film, Lola's entire point was to serve two purposes in life. Everyone wanted to fuck her, and she was good at basketball. Think of her as the Chuck Jones version of Wilt Chamberlain. But then, in more modern years, Warner Brothers had a few head-scratcher meetings and said, you know, maybe women would be more interested in our properties if our version of Minnie Mouse wasn't just a character there to slam dunk and flaunt her pussy everywhere. Which is awesome, by the way, and didn't need changing, but that's my journalistic opinion. Anyway, when the Looney Tunes show rolled around in 2011, which is about six years after this show, which, if you haven't watched it, it's a very, very, very good sitcom take on the whole Looney Tunes cast, they changed Lola from being an obvious athlete disguised as a whore and made her a quirky obsessive girlfriend type with a whole inexplicable life of her illogical nonsense. In even more recent years, they've also tried to give Lola a strong girl power angle, taking her boob and butt bravado and twisting it into a Xena warrior princess cabal in Space Jam 2. Long story short, Lola started out as an alley-oop for Michael Jordan Jordan and an oopsie broken condom for Bugs Bunny, before transforming into an oddball and a bad bitch in the last decade. And the key word of that sentence is last decade, because Lunatics Unleashed came out in 2005, which means Lexi Bunny, the descendant of Lola Bunny, is based 100% on a bona fide bimbo. And I wanted to add that context because I want you to be as excited as I am for whatever the fuck they think is going to be a good character walking through this door. Tech, did you order more than one pie? No, why? Cause Slam is in the house. What the fuck am I watching, man? <laughs> So Slam shows up and I'm really mad because he's all frozen and shit and a guy named Slam was obviously destined to have a cool intro. The lunatics get a call from... Stativa? Satavia? Siddhartha Buddha? Some lady. And Ace Bunny's voice actor just sounds... off? And I can't figure out why, but here, check out this clip and tell me I'm crazy. Lunatics, we have a problem. You got that right, Tadavia. I'd say we got a serious problem. The elite global defense force, I think, just now notices that the city they live in is being flash frozen. So Ace Bunny decides it's time to shoehorn in his catchphrase that I guess the Bugs family line has been saying for literally over 800 years by this point. Yeah, what's up, Sadavia? Certainly not the temperature. So far, nobody can figure out where this iceberg came from. I don't have to tell you what will happen if the temperature keeps dropping. I knew it. We're gonna lose cable again. Who is Sadavia? Who? Is this Granny? Is this Granny's long lost descendant? Maybe it's fucking Dan Backslide's long lost cousin. Who are you? 
You are the most unlooney tune looking human ever. And for this show, that's very impressive. Look at this screen cap. Look at it. Really take it in. Show this to anyone who doesn't know what this is and tell them this is the modern Looney Tunes reboot airing later this year. See how they react. Look at these stern faces coming from creatures who are known for cross-dressing to make his enemies horny and going meep meep. We're wrapping back around and stupid again and I'm starting to love it, but only because I feel like I'm watching Looney Tunes as directed by Zack Snyder. Tech? We'll need some toys to melt this ice cube. Excuse me, Chief. They're not toys. They're precision handcrafted alloy instruments. I have heard that far too many times from people defending their anime figurines. It doesn't matter what they're made out of. The hot glue marks are going to stick for life, kids. We'll take those too. But first, the toys. Hmm. <laughs> the Retrofire Master Blaster. Hold it in the palm of your hand. Squeeze twice. And... Immediately after this scene, Slam gets his foot caught in one of the guns while he transforms and flies around the room, and it's really poorly animated, and more importantly, it doesn't even come close to getting such a genuine giggle out of me as this frame right here. I'm sorry, can you blame me? I know I keep pausing to point out how bad shit this is, but it's like watching The Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe. Each and every frame can be considered its own masterpiece. Okay, so then everyone gets out their jetpacks and they fly outside when Ace Bunny says, time to jet, except Rev Runner doesn't have a jetpack and makes blue fire somehow. And they also never explain that. And it's not really important because those jetpacks are very toyetic. And I'm hoping I can still get to the Toys R Us in time to drop kick a crowd of fifth graders in my way from getting that last one. Sorry, that joke was probably too unbelievable. You know, the fact that there would ever be lunatics toys, not the Toys R Us thing. Oh, a man can dream. So the Looney Tunes with designs last seen on a knockoff backpack in a poor shop in the middle of a rural Indian village try blasting the ice with their blasters. It doesn't work. At all. It's making me question the blaster's inclusion in the first place, so it's time for plan B. You're on, Slam Buddy. <laughs> Okay, so why wasn't this plan A? Why do we have to go through the whole laser blaster gun bullshit when Slam Tasmanian, who I'm probably naming my firstborn son after, could have single-handedly taken care of the giant iceberg within seconds? The most cardinal sin of lunatics is absolutely the fact that we're six minutes in and it's just painfully unfunny. Oh, trust me, there's been a good handful of jokes that I've cut out that just don't land in any capacity, but after that, the most offensive thing about the whole show is that everyone in it's just kind of an idiot. But not the kind of Looney Tunes idiot where they'd go back and forth in a clever dance of outwitting each other. It's more so in a, I told you to stop eating things you found under the refrigerator kind of idiot. So Slam somehow melts all the ice in the city by spinning around really, really fast, and Danger Duck gets dick devastatingly jealous and wants to start a discussion that... Why Lexi Bunny got tiny butt cheeks? Why Lexi Bunny got tiny butt cheeks? Techie don't have any tiny butt cheeks. Why Lexi Bunny got tiny butt cheeks? Slam spins fast enough to become Global Warming's best ally when Lexi Bunny's tiny butt cheeks and her extra long ears pick up that the iceberg is doing something. And then it crumbles to reveal a giant Viking warship. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, stop, 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 stop. Look at, look at the scenery in this shot. The iceberg is very, very clearly in the middle of the city. There's buildings and stuff. And in the establishing shot on the monitor, it shows it is smack dab in the middle of downtown. How did they get to a dock? How, how is there a giant boat in front of the waterfront and that's how where everyone is now? Look, I know what's up dock is Bugs Bunny's catchphrase, but there's three key differences between the old delivery and this. Number one, the catchphrase refers to a doctor, not a shipping dock. Two, this is Ace Bunny and his team, not Bugs Bunny. And three, and most importantly of all, this show sucks absolute fucking dick. And out of the ship jumps some cyber vikings who are in each and every way, cooler designs than our protagonists. What's up, Doc? I am gonna. Gonna what? Go to a Viking convention at the Civic Center? No, we're here to take over your world. You know, you Frosted Flakes might as well go back to where you came from, because this is a no invasion zone. Did you see it? I pointed out earlier that the animation is really bad, but 
This is really embarrassing. Hi kids, Hugby's here, and it's time for another chapter of everyone's favorite segment, Why Japanese Anime is Peak Animation. Anime understands a very good principle of creating the very time-inducing medium of animation. You put your best stuff on display and cut corners when it doesn't matter. Have you ever noticed that tons of animes have incredible, amazing, well-animated intros and then a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, the actual show's animation just kind of very, very slightly begins sliding down in quality and never hits the level of the intro? That's because anime intros are very often outsourced to other studios who can dedicate way more time to just that sequence while the main animation team focuses on producing the entire show. For example, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the best anime, is a very well animated show made by David Production. But their intros, which are very complex, well choreographed visual delights, come from Kamikaze Doga, or Kamikaze Duga. I, I'm gonna say Doga, and everyone's gonna get mad if I'm wrong, and I'm not gonna care. This also happens in a ton of Western cartoons as well. Check out this clip from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles intro from 1987, and now compare it to the actual animation of the show. There's a noticeable decline in quality, right? Now the key difference is, JoJo's and Ninja Turtles understand that they have already won the audience over after the incredible title sequence, which is important because you're gonna be seeing that opening title sequence most likely more than any other animation in the show. Once that's established, the job of the main studio is to create solid enough animation that fits within the budget and time frame of the show's production, but is also serviceable enough or impressive enough to the people who actually want to watch the whole show. Now let's tie this back into the Warner Brothers uncreative vomit party. Oops, sorry, I, I meant to use the official title. Let's tie this back into Lunatics Unleashed. The Lunatics Unleashed intro is really bad. It's clips from episodes with character key art posts and a whir of largely useless special effects. It sucks, and for a cartoon from the 2000s, it feels very blatantly like a quick slapdash job to take advantage of the new emerging field of lazy, cut-and-paste, schedule-smashing digital animation. And the point I'm making with all of this is that if your intro is a stale, generic piece of shit that's not selling your show in any way, and your animation of your show is a copy-and-paste digital hackery, then your consistency better be really fucking high because people are going to to be paying attention to the writing, characters, and world building more than anything else. So this animation error of Ace Bunny's jetpack blinking the fuck out of existence should piss you off just as much as it does me, because I can't be the only one paying attention. Okay, fine, fine. We can, we can calm down with one of the few enjoyable bits from the show so far. We will conquer your world by any means necessary. No, you won't. Yes, we will. No, you won't. Yes, we will. Yes, you will. No, we won't conquer your world. Have it your way. Ooh, I will enjoy crushing you, rabbit. Really standard Bugs Bunny style back and forth here, and I'll admit it got a chuckle out of me the first time I watched, but it's specifically because while the animation here is just really, really bad, the counterplay of these over-the-top X to the extreme character designs having such a childish argument gets me a bit giggly. When this dynamic happens in a classic Technicolor cartoon, there's some actual smug banter going on. But in this cartoon, it's like watching Captain Picard and a Klingon sitting in a car while Picard hovers his hand over the Klingon and says, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. It's just hilariously out of character by just glance alone. You don't even need context to know that something isn't right here. Let's put this city on ice! <laughs> <laughs> they rely entirely on Ace Bunny to use his laser vision and it doesn't work, so they all just kind of just kind of stand there to get frozen together. Even though each and every one of them has a laser cannon that was made by Techie, and they spent three whole minutes introducing us to the fact that they all have superpowers, but I don't know. Everyone everyone just huddled together and be stupid, I guess. How 
did the gang get all frozen together in what looks like their key art poses when just before this they were clearly huddled together having emotions and stuff? No, look, that is not at all how they were frozen, and why are Rev Runner's eyes totally blacked out? Anyway, Danger Duck's superpower, which I didn't talk about before because who gives a shit, is teleportation. And while he's entirely frozen from tip to toe, thereby unable to think or move, he uses his teleportation to get out of the ice block. And now I get to bring up one of my favorite arguments in all of fiction which I lovingly dub the Ant-Man Paradox. Teleportation as a power in fiction pretty much can never work unless you establish the caveats that you can't control it or there's limits, etc., etc. Because if you are given rampant location immediate change, such as growing and shrinking in size, teleporting, zapping, etc., etc., I need you to ask yourself this question and realize that that concept ruins any and all stories. It's called the Ant-Man Paradox because it was very often brought up as a topic of debate during the Avengers movies, but it's an idea that's been around for a while. Why doesn't Danger Duck at any point in this story just teleport directly into the anus of his enemies and instantaneously explode them from the inside out. Made you think. The gang continues to make more painful jokes when they get a phone call from everyone's favorite artificial sweetener, Sadavia. And this is the part of the show that gets really weird. Like, like really, really weird. I, I don't know why they did this, and it's it's cool that they did this, and I, ju I just don't have a good explanation for why this is part of the episode. Okay, so Sadavia spends the next three full minutes telling all the viewers watching that they should go check out Hugby's Gamer Mode on YouTube. Now, she says that it's this brand new channel Hugby's launched to focus on gaming and other goofy content, and it's really good and worth subscribing to. And then she just goes on and on and on about Hugby's, the best creator on this entire website, decided to put out a large chunk of content for absolutely free alongside his typical uploads, and all that you have to do to see it is check out the channel linked in the description. That's it. Now, why would Warner Brothers do that? Why would Warner Brothers pause the entire cartoon, no matter how bad it is, to advertise my new gaming channel a whole 18 years before it even exists? How did they know I would link it into the description of this very video? You know, Hugby's Gamer Mode, my new gaming channel. That's so weird. Anyway, when that strange tangent is over, Sadavia boringly explains what we all have completely and utterly figured out just by watching the show. And the gang's attacked and the Vikings shoot a big blaster cannon that uses a stock ray gun sound effect that you've no doubt heard 400 times before. We, the audience, are then treated to another gourmet smattering of impressively unfunny jokes, and then Exposition Bunny explains that being frozen in the ice block together short-circuited their jetpack backpacks, which keen viewers will point out should not affect Rev Runner at all, because he makes his jetpack flames through his body, but that was all back when he was busy channeling the Shadow Realm via his sclera. Got a backup plan, Tech? Glad you asked. <laughs> And then they fight. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, fuck. Fuck, sorry. Oh, shit. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm I'm just falling asleep from how dull this all is. No, not the show. It's the fact that right now I'm entertaining thoughts of people enjoying this piece of shit and having genuine nostalgia for it. So Ace Bunny's incredible leadership plan worthy of making him the next president is to attack when they run out of stock laser beams, which he for some reason knows exactly when that will happen, and then it does happen, and we get this premium specimen of lemon taste skin crawling cringe. Which is right now. Let the fun begin. Aye aye, Skipper. 
Lunatics, unite! It's like a, my entire body ate a warhead. I'm not sure why an involuntary reaction of backwashing vomit was the response the Warner Brothers executives wanted to achieve with this show, but let's just say the only thing preventing Mr. Clean from having to step in right now to mop up my carpet is the eight-pack abs that I keep hidden under my shirt at all times. I don't know whose abs they are, but they're really handy. And then God, in his infinite wisdom, appears as a holy visage of light in the clouds and says, Fuck this. Fuck all of this. I'm canceling all of this for good. In fact, I'm canceling this entire fictional version of Earth because it fucking sucks. No, I wish this is what actually happens. Tech, you've outdone yourself. You can say it. I'm a genius. Launch the torpedo! Yes, Lamb. We didn't see that one coming. Toy Nope, did that one. Did that already. Did the did the the hidden guitar joke. I, okay, I'm just gonna, gonna stand here. I don't know where to put my hands. Um I'm just gonna stand here politely until until the uh Till this is over. What's going on now? Oh, they're flying now. Oh, it flies now. That's so, so cool. If I was 10, this would be something that I, nope, never mind, because this is still during the peak era of video games. Resident Evil 4 came out the same year as this, and boy, that's way cooler than this. I'm just saying. So there's all this complex, stupid, really dumb, I'm out of words for it all, bullshit, nonsense, techno stuff that fails and Slam Tasmanian takes over and improvises, just throwing the mortar shells at the other ship. Have you ever noticed that pretty much every single problem in this show either is or could be solved by Slam Tasmanian just hulking the fuck out? All the fancy schmancy, ooh, it's 700 years in the future crap has been pretty much useless compared to benching three times your body weight and Googling whether a creatine shaker enema is the more efficient path to swollness. The point is, why make a show about being as toyetic and future designed as possible when every single problem is just going to devolve into, and then the Tasmanian Devil knockoff did the thing that Taz already had done for nearly a hundred years by this point. It's pointless. If you want to give us new characters that are totally original and donut steel, give them something original on their formula. I'd see all of this working far, far better if they went the route of Beast from the X-Men. Beast is a big hulking beast, but the joke is he's a hyper-intelligent, sophisticated doctor who values science over Hulk smash. Change the characters so that Slam Tasmanian is the one making all of the inventions in the show. That way you get a good noticeable divergence from the mindless destruction of the original Tasmanian devil. Yes, you can also make Slam Tasmanian super strong, but give him a weakness such as he abhors violence to a ridiculous level of pacifism, or when action goes down and he's not able to hide behind any of his technology, he's actually an inept fighter and a huge coward. Then for Techie Coyote, rename him to something like Recky Coyote, which is a closer tie into Wily Coyote, by the way, and make him a bloodthirsty, out of control violence maniac. Are these totally different characters than the ones we've grown up with and love? If they are, then play with the formula and mess with it to create something different and interesting. You know, the entire reason to make a new roster in the first place. And if these are just supposed to be the same characters again, then why make a new roster at all. So far, the entire show's plot could be replaced with one day Bugs was fucking around like he always does and he accidentally locked himself and his friends in a time machine. When they awoke in the future, they met some cosmic space bitch named Splenda and she gave them superpowers in exchange for helping to protect the futuristic post-apocalyptic Earth from evil because they're the chosen ones or some shit. Now there's a lot, and I mean a lot of reasons to really hate this show, and you should. but. Something that, as a person who really values good writing and world building and emotional character investment, there's something that really fucking frustrates me with this show. 
I have zero zilch nada reason to enjoy this new cast of characters or want to see them do anything. We are 13 minutes into the pilot episode and every single character is, it's the Looney Tunes, except they ride futuristic vehicles. The end. That's it. That's all that's happened. I hate this show. I really do. And we still have a whole third act to go. The enemy ship explodes and there's some unfunny quips and Slam Tasmanian begins fucking Lexi Bunny just out of frame until the Vikings crash land and the lunatics unleash their terrible attempts at jokes all over the ship. They deduce that the Vikings get their power from their horns, and it's just something that Techie says and is able to figure out immediately, because I'm guessing that his breakfast consisted of a big glass of Sunny D mixed with Ritalin. And then this shit happens. Hey Rev, can you get me a read on them Nordic nutjobs? They're heading for the planetary power grid. Okay, can everyone just do everything in this universe? Rev Runner is both a speedster and a GPS. Ace Bunny is a martial artist and he can shoot lasers out of his eyes. Can Lexi Bunny also brew a mean espresso using just her tiny butt cheeks? Does Techie create nuclear fission by urinating? Why is Slam Tasmanian, a character who never speaks, still the best character so far because all he does is smash and that's all I need to know about him. This show was blatantly made to sell product first and answer questions never. Buy the toys based on the vehicles, get the merchandise with the characters on it, keep the Looney Tunes relevancy alive, and shut the fuck up. Which is really funny, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so the Vikings that weren't on the ship that got exploded are gonna try to freeze the city's power core, which will destroy the whole planet because that's how this planet works. And while they're successfully sabotaging and infiltrating the core's outer shell, I'm just gonna scoop my chair back over here so I can get comfortable while I remind everyone who forgot that each and every lunatic is an impressively dumb motherfucker. The lunatics are aware of the enemy's exact location. Danger Duck can teleport, and Rev Runner can run at supersonic speed. What do you think the lunatics' plan is? If you guessed stupidly fly in on their fourth unnecessary vehicle of the episode and save the day, then you're wrong! Because they're gonna fly in on their fourth unnecessary vehicle of the episode while doing some sick coordinated loop-de-loops to give the villains ample time to cripple the city's power grid by freezing a portion of the core and then save the day. Just watch this next part, I don't even want to fucking talk about this anymore. You picked the wrong planet to invade! Pally. Why Lexi Bunny got tiny butt cheeks? Why Lexi Bunny got tiny butt? And then the most boringest action scene to ever be boring happens and everyone's just so absurdly overpowered that when they really care, they don't ever lose a fight, which, you know, they almost never care though because they gotta make sure that there's time to ride a brand new vehicle every six hours, but whatever. Tech rewires the bad guy's helmets and utilizing a core overload, he kills every Viking ever. But we haven't been very loony, have we? That fight scene was about, I don't know, three hours long based on my slowed passage of time. We gotta throw in some slapstick. There's no Looney Tunes without slapstick. Show me something loony. Ah, Tech, I was just about to let him have it. Talk about taking one for the team. Tech? <laughs> Well, Jesus, that was horrifying. We cut to what I assume is the Lunatic's Watchtower, featuring a thick white outline to the left of the screen that I'm going to assume is due to a misaligned animation layer, because I want to take each and every single angle I can to tell this show to go fuck itself. Oh, and, and then the show ends. Yeah, that's, that's, there's some really awful attempts at comedy and character building in the last final scenes, but the show is over. All that was left was like two minutes of nothing. So now that it's over, and remember that this show would continue on for two full seasons, what did everyone think of it? According to an article from USA Today, world-renowned talking person and anti-comedian Jimmy Kimmel made a joke on his talk show about the new design, saying, quote, Tweety Bird looks like a hooker from space. Now, normally I'd applaud the Man Show alumni, but more importantly, that's not Tweety Bird. 
That's not even Roadrunner. That's Revrunner, you stupid motherfucker. I know I'm calling Jimmy out on this 18 years too late, but I really think we should just cancel him over the whole thing. But out of all the big news commentators and Proto Web 2.0 wisecrackers, I think Warner Brothers themselves put it best in a retrospective article written by the New York Times in 2010. Current president of Warner Brothers Animation, Sam Register, made a statement in that article claiming that art from the Lunatics Unleashed is permanently framed and hung on the walls of Warner's Animation Studios as a reminder of what not to do. And there is one final lasting piece of legacy that's bizarrely full circle and ties a lot of things with this video in on itself, but... It requires me to speak some words aloud that I promised myself I would never utter again. Have you ever seen Teen Titans Go? Okay, so there's this show called Teen Titans Go, and it's got an episode called... Hugbees, which has forever and ever ruined what happens if you Google my name. But it's an episode where the Lobe from Freakazoid shows up and starts running amok in Teen Titans land. And the Titans conclude the only way to stop the Lobe is by resurrecting his arch rival and 90s superhero, Freakazoid. Go ahead and give a gander at the first 17 seconds. <laughs> And it's coming from Warner Brothers Animation in Burbank. Oh, but no! Has someone jumped in the Friends fountain? Did they reboot the Lunatics? Weird, right? How all this just kind of swirls together into a big Hugby's expanded universe? But regardless, this name drop alongside a couple other self-aware snides showed that this series now exists primarily as the butt of a joke and nothing more. Outside of these little rib jabbers, I haven't heard a single utterance of this series ever. And the only reason I'm even doing a video on this is because I had to get my grubby little hands all over it to see what the problem was myself. I had never even seen this show before I started this project, but it happened to echo deep within my subconscious after seeing the phrase lunatics appear on my upcoming projects list four separate times, which meant I knew it was time to put them back in the spotlight for the first time in almost two decades. Okay, now here comes the big plot twist of the whole video, the turnaround point where I drop some shocking information on you not readily available in the first place. Here it goes. I don't like this show. Lunatics is impressive in that it's not just bad, it's a microcosm of how to make the worst cartoon imaginable. A completely soulless boardroom directed idea passed off as a faulty passing of the torch. Too stupid for any competent artist to realize it doesn't work beyond the realm of self-awareness and yet in that perfect sweet spot for out of touch suits to push off as the new hotness. Drenched in blatant toy crossover promotion, nostalgia wankery, brand parasitic Citizen, and worst of all, definitely worst of all, a complete and utter lack of actual comedy. I mean, fuck me, Ace Bunny makes the What's Up Doc reference four times in the pilot episode, and not even Bugs Bunny himself said it that often. And the show is so blatantly, blatantly made to sell toys and merchandise, and yet... Hardly any of it was ever made because the show was just so unpopular. And what little prototypes they did make looked like this. Lunatics is absolutely joyless. It's not funny, it's not interesting, it's not exciting. It's nothing. A lot of my video reviews of panned pop culture often include specific bullet notes of things I do like. Places where the work in question succeeds in concept. Maybe they had a really good idea and executed it poorly. Maybe there's a moment or two where things do come together, but they don't capitalize on it. Maybe we hit the golden child of doing things so badly that they wrap back around to being amazing, harnessing the concept of so bad it's good and making it its bitch. But the only bitch here is me forcing my way through this slog. Just watching the first episode took me like three days because I couldn't bear to stand another minute after getting the script to a minute ratio of about 400 to 1. Lunatics Unleashed is truly a pitiful cartoon. It's such an obvious death rattle of depraved relevancy in an ever-evolving market. Lunatics Unleashed is a checklist of the production assembly line without any facet of heart left in it because it was stuck in the back of the delivery truck. Lunatics Unleashed sucks. Bad. 
and I'd wager it's the worst thing that the Looney Tunes have ever, ever done. Oh, wait, no, no wait, no, the, the racism. There was that time where Bugs Money was just super, super racist. Like, really, really racist. Okay, never mind.